sharing good news of great joy to all people. Elation Church. Welcome to Elation Church. We're so excited that you've joined in with us today for worship. Have you ever thought about the word blessing? You know, most of the time when we think about that word bless or blessing, we think about God blessing us, and He is a God of blessing. But have you ever thought about the way that you can be a blessing to God? The psalmist put it this way. He said, I will bless the Lord at all times, and His praise will continually be in my mouth. So I encourage you to join in with us today as we lift up our voices in praise to God and bless the Lord together. Let's pray together. God, that's our hearts today as we come together is to lift up your holy name and to worship you in spirit and in truth. And I pray that as we look into your word, that you would speak to our hearts. Help us to receive everything you have for us. Cause your word to come alive by your Holy Spirit and help us to be doers of your word and not hearers only. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Well, I can't believe this is week nine in our series that I've entitled Under the Umbrella. And as we get started each week, I remind you that God has always desired to be the king of his people. 
And when we honor God as king with our lives, we wind up living under the umbrella of his blessing, provision, and protection. The Bible's filled with stories. Some of those stories are stories of success and some are stories of failure. And a wise person always learns from the mistakes and failures of others instead of learning everything the hard way. And I'm sure you're like me. There's a lot of things that you've learned the hard way. And hopefully there's a lot of things that you've learned the wise way by learning from other people's mistakes. This series is taken from the book of Judges. And the book of Judges is a historical account of God's people generation after generation. And they will live for God, but then they'll come to a point where they turn away from God. And then they'll turn back to God, and then God delivers them. He raises up someone who's a judge, a military leader, not a judge in the sense that we look at the word judge today, but a military leader to bring them deliverance and to bring them out from the oppression of their enemies. The overall idea of the book of Judges is found in Judges 17, verse 6. And it says this, in those days, the times of the judges, this whole spread of hundreds of years, in those days, Israel had no king. See, God wanted to be their king, but they didn't acknowledge God as king the majority of the time. And the Bible says, when you have no king, you wind up doing whatever seems right in your own eyes. And that's this time during the judges. They had no king and the people did whatever seemed right in their own eyes. And when we live by what seems right, instead of according to God what is right, we wind up in bad shape, living out from under God's umbrella of blessing, provision, and protection. In our journey so far, we've seen several unlikely heroes that God called out to deliver His people. The first one we looked at was Othniel. He was 75 years old. You don't think of a 75-year-old man as being the military leader. Then we looked at Ehud. He was handicapped. His right side was closed up. You don't think of a handicapped person as being a military leader. Then we looked at Shamgar. He was just a farmer. And he led God's people to victory just with a common farming tool, an ox goad. Then we looked at Deborah a godly lady. But especially during this time, you didn't see ladies leading a military effort. And then we just wrapped up several weeks talking about Gideon. So far, he's been the most well-known person of the judges. But we remember Gideon was weak. He said he was the weakest person from the weakest tribe of God's people. So all these people were unlikely heroes. Now today we're going to pick up our story and possibly be talking about a judge that you may be completely unfamiliar with, like some of the other ones that we've talked about. But let's look at Judges 10, verses 6 through 9. It says this, Again, the Israelites did evil in the Lord's sight. They served the images of Baal and the Ashtoreth and the gods of Aram, Sidon, Moab, Ammon, and Philistia. They abandoned the Lord and no longer served Him at all. So as we read what happened this time, it seems that it's a lot more serious than any of the other times. I mean, there's multiple gods and they no longer serve the Lord at all. Verse 7 says this, So the Lord burned with anger against Israel. If you look up the Hebrew words that's translated burn with anger, it means that His nostrils flared. So we can look at it, you know, as a parent. Let's let's look at God as a good father. I want want you to think about a parent whose children keep making the same mistakes over and over and over again, and the parent continues to help them and bless them and provide for them and love them. But you got to realize that the parent, as the child would do it again, make the wrong move again, Turn away from the parent again. Turn away from the parent's love again. You know, the parent would just... uh, I mean, it's not totally anger, but it is like a sigh. It's like, really? Not again. That's, That's the way I interpret the Hebrew that's interpreted in the English version that we're using, burn with anger against Israel. 
And then it says this, he turned them over to the Philistines and the Ammonites who began to oppress them that year. And then it says this, for 18 years, they oppressed all the Israelites east of the Jordan River. In the land of the Amorites, that is Gilead, the Ammonites also crossed to the west side of the Jordan and attacked Judah, Benjamin, and Ephraim. The Israelites were in great distress. Now, as we talked about it, God never wanted His people to turn away from Him. And He had promised them that He would bless them and protect them and provide for them if they would keep Him as their God and honor Him as King. But again, they turned away from God. And God wouldn't hold them back from turning away. I mean, if they wanted to turn away from God, they could. But God would say He would always be there patiently waiting for them to come back. And it, he, it grieved Him and He sighed and He... And he <laughs> He couldn't believe that they were going away again. Now this disobedience, this turning away from God, was set up by the disobedience of previous generations. And we've talked about that on our journey. If you're just joining with us, I encourage you to go back over the, especially the, the introductory weeks of this study. But it was caused and it was set up by the disobedience of previous generations of their forefathers and ancestors. And it would be awesome and amazing if someone would stand up and they would break the cycle. Because this cycle has just repeated itself over and over and over and over again. God would bring them deliverance and they, they would live in peace and blessing and provision and protection for a season, sometimes 20 years, sometimes 40 years, sometimes 80 years, but then they would fall right back into that old cycle of turning away from God. And they should have broke the cycle. And I want to encourage you and myself, if there are times when it seems like we're going through cycles of living for God and loving God and serving God, and then times of falling back into just living for ourselves, we need to break that cycle and honor God as King of our lives and stay there with Him. God's people should have broke this cycle. They should have recognized it. They should have learned from the mistakes of previous generations, but they just kept learning it the hard way. Let's go back to your text. Judges 10, starting with verse 10. Finally, they cried out to the Lord for help. Does that sound familiar? Saying, we have sinned against you because we have abandoned you as our God and have served the images of Baal. The Lord replied, Did I not rescue you from the Egyptians, the Amorites, the Ammonites, the Philistines, and the Sidonians, the Amalekites, and the Maonites? Did, didn't I rescue you from all these people when they oppressed you? You cried out to me for help, and I rescued you, God said. Verse 13, yet you have abandoned me and served other gods. Listen to what God says. So I will not rescue you anymore. Go and cry out to the gods you have chosen. Let them rescue you in your hour of distress. Wow, that seems harsh, doesn't it? I mean, because over and over again, generation after generation, God's people turned and cried out to God for help, and then God would deliver them. But this time, God's people cry out to God for help, and God says, well, why don't you call on those other gods since you keep turning away from me and turning to those other gods, worshiping those false gods, those man-made imagination gods, why don't, why don't you cry out to them for help? He says, I'm not going to help you anymore. And that seems harsh, but I want us to recall Romans chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. It says this, it says, Should we keep on sinning so that God can show us more and more of His wonderful grace? And some of the strongest language in the Bible is, Of course not! 
We shouldn't continue turning away from God and turning away from God and turning away from God just because He's going to deliver us and rescue us, right? I mean, that's crazy to think that. That we should just go on sinning so that God's wonderful grace would be displayed. No, we, we shouldn't live our lives thinking that way. And for 18 years, God's people turned away from Him again. And He's just reminding them, look, I just keep delivering you over and over and over and over and over again, but this time I'm not. And I believe this is why. Because God was not responding to their lip service. You see, they were crying out to God for help while they were still worshiping all of those false gods and still had all of those idols and all of those worship centers and all those temples where they were worshiping these false gods. And I don't believe God was being responsive to their lip service because they hadn't done anything about all the idols in their houses yet. See, here's the deal. God knew their hearts. God knew their hearts and God knows our hearts. And I believe their hearts weren't in the right place for God to say, you know, I'm, I'm just not going to deliver you this time. Because their hearts were still far from God. They were just crying out to God for deliverance, but they weren't crying out to God to worship God and to live for God and to serve God. Their, their lives, there was no change in their life. They just crying out to God for help. They really had no intention to turn away from those false gods that they had been worshiping. It was like God was their lucky rabbit's foot or good luck charm. They were just crying out to Him. Hey, maybe God can help us, you know? We're not worshiping Him. We don't love Him. We're not planning on serving Him, but maybe He'll help us again. They were just looking at God as a deliverer and not as a king. Let's go back to our text. Judges 10, starting with verse 15 says this, But the Israelites pleaded with the Lord and said, We have sinned. Punish us as you see fit. Only rescue us today from our enemies. Then, now here comes the repentance. Up until this point, it was just lip service. Here comes the repentance. It says in verse 16, Then the Israelites put aside their foreign gods and served the Lord. And he... God was grieved by their misery. See, when they actually turned away from those idols, and when they turned their hearts to God, and when they began to serve the Lord and do away with all the idol worship, it says God was grieved by their misery. You know why? God is grieved when His people move out from under His umbrella. When, when His people aren't experiencing His blessing and provision and protection, God is grieved because He has so much for His people. And just like He was grieved over the Israelites turning away from Him and, and being oppressed by all these other nations, God was grieved when they turned back to Him. I mean, it's just like, I have so much for you. I have so much love for you. I have so much blessing for you. I have so much that I want you to enjoy when I am your king under my umbrella of blessing, provision, and protection. I have so much for you. But I'm grieved when you don't experience it, when you turn your back on me and don't experience it. And God gets grieved the same way. The Holy Spirit gets grieved the same way when we try to live our lives our own way and not live spirit-filled and spirit-led lives. The fullness of life, of God's life and love and joy and peace, that's what God wants for you and that's what He wants for me as we live honoring Him as King of our lives and Jesus as Lord of our lives. So God was grieved over the misery of His people that they weren't enjoying all the blessing, provision, and protection under His umbrella. And then we go to Judges 11, verse 1. And here comes our next hero. It says, Now Jephthah of Gilead was a great warrior. <laughs> now wait a minute. All of the other 
deliverers that God had for his people. They were so unlikely in age and handicapped and in gender and in weakness, all those things that we talked about. And this deliverer starts out by saying he's a great warrior. He's a great warrior. If you're going to pick anybody, you're going to pick this guy, right? Now, Jephthah of Gilead was a great warrior. He was physically mighty and powerful. He was an able force. He was a strong leader. All of those things are found in that phrase, great warrior. Let's go back to our text and go through verse 3. Now, Jephthah of Gilead was a great warrior. He was the son of Gilead, but his mother was a prostitute. Gilead's wife also had several sons. And when these half-brothers grew up, they chased Jephthah off the land. You will not get any of our father's inheritance, they said, for you're the son of a prostitute. So Jephthah fled from his brothers and lived in the land of Tob. Soon he and a band of worthless rebels following him. He, he got guys up. He, they like lived the lives of pirates, all right, because he was strong and, and he just got a band of worthless rebels following him. And they would, they would raid and steal and pillage and all those kind of things. That's the way he lived because he got ran off from his family. And he was, you know, and, and the bad thing is, listen, he was punished for the sins of his father. His whole family turned his back on him. His dad and his brothers, everybody, he got ran out of town because of the sins of his father. You got to know, he's just an innocent young boy growing up in the home and an innocent young man, but the whole family turns on him. Not because of what he did, but because of what his dad did. He was a reject. He was an outcast because of his father's sin. Let's continue. Judges 11, 4 through 7. At about this time, the Ammonites began their war against Israel. When the Ammonites attacked, the elders of Gilead sent for Jephthah in the land of Tob. The elders said, Come and be our commander. Help us fight the Ammonites. But Jephthah said to them, Aren't you the ones who hated me and drove me from my father's house? Why do you come to me now when you're in trouble? Jephthah said, See, he had a decision to make at this point. Would he be just holding on to anger and bitterness and, and how he was mistreated as a boy and as a young man and ran off from his family? Would, would, he, would he hold on to that or not? See, the decision was up to him. He could have said, I don't want anything to do with you. And that, that would have been a mistake in his life, even though when we look at the story, we would say, he don't owe them anything. Why, why should he go back and do something? Well, we'll find out by the end of the story. In Judges eleven eight, 8, it says this. He said, why should I come back, right? Aren't you the ones who hated me and ran me off? And they said, because we need you, Jephthah, the elders replied. If you lead us in battle against the Ammonites, we will make you ruler over all the people of Gilead. What an offer. They said, if you'll come back and help us and lead us, we'll make you the ruler over our whole tribe. You'll be the leader of the tribe. In verse 9, Jephthah said to the elders, let me get this straight. <laughs> if I come with you and if the Lord gives me victory over the Ammonites, listen to what he said, if the Lord gives me victory over the Ammonites, will you really make me ruler over all the people? And they said, the Lord is our witness, the elders replied. We promise to do whatever you say. So Jephthah went with the elders of Gilead and the people made him their ruler and commander of the army. Here's what I want you to realize. Jephthah did not allow his past to determine his future. 
I'm going to say that one more time. Because if you miss this, you miss one of the greatest points of this whole message and word from God today. Jephthah did not allow his past to determine his future. See, so many people are so bound in their past and in, in the opportunities that they didn't have or the things that they went through and the, the uh, you know, all everybody's against them and their family's against them and people hurt them and, and all these people abuse them. And so many times people hold on to their past and by holding on to their past, they never step in to the future that God wants them to step into because they're so bound up in their past. But listen, let's be encouraged today because Jephthah did not allow his past to determine his future. And I want to tell you, no matter how bad anything has ever been in your past, it's time to let those things go and stop allowing those things to destroy your future. Don't allow your past to determine your future. Don't let it impact it. Don't let it destroy your future. And that's the message of Jephthah because he didn't do that. And listen to what happened. In Judges eleven twenty nine. it says this, At that time, the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah. When, when he said, okay, <laughs> I'm, I'm, not gonna hold, I'm not gonna hold on to my dad's sin and what that brought into my life, and I'm not gonna hold on to what my brothers did as they ran me out. No, no, I'm, I'm gonna come back and I'm gonna help you. I'm not gonna let my past determine my future. And right when he said that, the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. And then in Judges 11.32, it says this, So Jephthah led his army against the Ammonites, and the Lord gave him victory. So today, our unlikely hero, Jephthah, you know, it started out, well, he's a great warrior, Right? But he had so much baggage from his past. But he was able to let all that baggage go and step in to the victory in God and step in to the future that, that was available to him by the Holy Spirit of God, by allowing the Holy Spirit of God to come upon him and for him to lead God's people to victory. It was a defining moment in Jephthah's life. And when God's people repented now and turned their hearts back to Him and turned away from their idol worship and began to worship and serve the Lord, God empowered another deliverer, Jephthah, to lead them in victory over their enemies. And as a result, all of God's people moved back under His umbrella of blessing, provision, and protection. Let's pray together. God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the truth in your word. And God, I pray that we would take hold of the things that you spoke to our heart today by your Holy Spirit. God, help us to never allow things that happened to us in our past to destroy our future. Because your plans for us are good to prosper us, not to harm us, to give us a hope, and to give us a future. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thanks again for joining with us here today at Elation Church, and thanks for being a part of our Elation family. Would you consider doing three things today? Would you consider sharing today's message? All you have to do is hit that share button right under the video to share it with all of your social media friends. Another thing I'd like to ask you to do is pray for us here at Elation Church. And if there's anything we can pray with you about, I encourage you to go to our website, www.elation.church, and share a prayer request with us. 
And then the third thing I'd like for you to consider is this. Would you consider partnering with us financially as we continue to reach out in our mission? It's so easy. All you have to do is text ELATION to 28950 and follow the prompts. In doing any of these things, you'll be joining with us in our mission of bringing good news of great joy to all people. And we'll see you right back here next week at Elation Church. This online worship experience was brought to you by the friends and partners of Elation Church.